Welcome to Couve.com. I'm David Medor, and we have Carolyn Crane, who is a candidate for the 49th Legislative District, with us today for an interview. Carolyn, you are challenging a 10-year incumbent, Jim Moeller, for the legislature to represent Vancouver proper. Uh, welcome, Carolyn. Thank you. The, uh, I'd like to be able to see w the contrast between you and Jim Muller when it comes to priorities, when it comes to issues. If we can uh, jump right into the economy first and jobs, just about everybody that we've talked to says jobs, 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 we've got to somehow got to do jobs uh, you know, or address the jobs problem. Um, can you make it as concise as you can, contrast between your approach to bringing, solving the jobs crisis in our state uh, and how your approach varies with good contrast with Jim Muller. Okay, well with the job process that we're having, we have a no jobs. <laughs> and we actually seem to have long range planning groups that have designed uh, the future for us, the policies that will guide us into the future based on 0.78 jobs per household recognizing that we need 0.285. Now, I don't know... What, what does that mean? Well, that means that as we lay out a plan for what will the future of our community, what will the future of our state look like, mm -hmm. especially in our community, the local area groups have set this up to where long-range plans for zoning and coding, for the development of new businesses, for the types of jobs and all that sort of thing. The wage rates are structured with the types of jobs at a level that it would require you to have 2.85, you, me, and another three quarters or better of us to sustain a household, okay? Uh, they haven't given enough jobs. They haven't given enough land and prepared in the future for enough business development and growth to do more than 0.75. In other words, uh, we need to be able to have designated land for people to have, uh, for businesses. Is that what you're saying? That we need that. We also need to plan what type of businesses those are. That is done upstate, really, with the legislature setting policies that guide us forward. Okay. Let, let me ask you this. When it comes to the barriers that keep people from starting businesses in the first place and expanding so that they can grow their business, maybe add uh, on so that they have room for employees to work, uh, what would you do to somehow make that process easier at the state level? I believe we need to set up a, an oversight committee in the legislature to uh, review and pass final approval, I guess, on all the uh, rules and regulations that are coming out of the Department of Ecology and the Department of Natural Resources. Okay. Uh, these I, two I, branches are stifling our, our economic development okay, with their rules. Okay, that sounds like that's consistent with what uh, Senator Don Benton was, was, uh, is pushing for. Uh, the way it works right now is that the le state legislature makes a pretty general purpose kind of a law with an intention and that goes to the Department of Ecology or some other agency, they make rules that are very, very specific. And at this point, there is no oversight. They just have at it. Yeah. And it, it's uh, the way I see that the role, of, uh, the role of state government is to provide a general kind of a guideline and some limits, but the specifics are left to the counties. And the, and the dysfunction that we see in our state is that the state is micromanaging the counties. And this is not working for, our, for Clark County at all. So I think what you're saying is that the, when that agency, like the Department of Ecology, makes these rules, they don't just become law. They go back to, this, to, to a, the legislature, and elected officials will then say yay or nay or refine those and, before they become law. 
Absolutely. Okay, great. <laughs> that way that that way the people have some level of control over their economy, their government and their environment. Okay, so the so basically you're on the same page as Don Benton. Absolutely. Right? Okay. Absolutely. There's no other way to do this. They've gone so far out of control. 43 rule makers and when they're done making rules in order to keep a job, they got to figure out what rules to make. <laughs> At yeah, some but, point you've got to stop. Uh, so we have yeah, there's how, how many uh, state uh, assembly uh, pe positions are there, and how many senators positions are there? There are 49 senators and 98 representatives. And so, so there's, there's fully al almost one third as of, of that total amount mm -hmm. in just rule makers that are hired and so not elected. In other words, for just the Department of Ecology, you have almost as, as many full-time rule makers, which is basically lawmakers, in, in this one agency as you do state senators. That's right. And they're the one, they're making a, a whole lot more, uh, many more laws, it seems, than the, than the legislature. That's absolutely which is, right. Which is, and we're feeling the effects of that in, in the way that... They actually stifle the legislature, too, with those laws. Think about that a minute. We need some development. I, you, you talked about the differences between my opponent and I. Mm -hmm. My opponent is telling me, and all of us, that uh, we have to have the Columbia River crossing. We have to have light rail. This is a compromise between two states. I don't see a compromise when we're picking up the tab and we're not really getting anything for it. So I said this to him. What are we getting out of this? Mm -hmm. We don't qualify based on our population for light rail, and we won't. Mm -hmm. That came out in the last oversight. In meeting. other words, light rail only makes sense for super high density. We don't have anywhere near we that. We don't have anywhere near that, and we don't have it planned in our future. Mm -hmm. Back to that long range plan. And Jim Moeller is, out of all of the legislators, Jim Moeller is the number one proponent for light rail funded by tolls in the state. He went, yes, he went so far as to write the. Uh, Prop 1 pro statement in our pamphlet for this election cycle. So I would say he is the number is, one right. so you water can, carrier. Yes, and he has also <laughs> provided, uh, actually provided, he's the one that talked our legislature, legislature into funding, given the CRC bureaucracy, an extra $50 million, 25 from Washington, 25 million from Oregon. So you could not have a stronger proponent of light rail funded by tolls than Jim Moeller. That's Has he ever had right. any reservations on that? Have you ever seen him I uh, saw waver? Him. Is he always fully full well, speed ahead? Uh, I saw him waver at the, at the August 20th oversight hearing where he sat down and it was it was in part two. You can see it on CVTV, uh, August 20th taping. It's, it's not a great quality uh, tape, but pay close attention because about 20 minutes into part two, he makes a statement where he comes up and he says he can't believe we're gonna spend $3.6 billion and may wind up with a design with a lift in it after all, which is what we already have. Okay, and so then he talks about should we just stop this whole process and at what point do we do that and just start the whole design over. Okay, it sounds like the, the he, what he was addressing at the time, and I'm guessing because I haven't really watched that, that clip, uh, is that the design they have right now, it doesn't accommodate uh, the river traffic very well at all. The, at least the Coast Guard says, sorry, that's not good enough. It's too low. And so th the solution for that uh, is to somehow provide it, uh, something approaching what we currently have now. And his approach on that is that <laughs> it's not like, well, guys, if we're going to start over, uh, we better put the brakes on. If you're going to try to solve that problem, the, the, it's the design, either full speed ahead or nothing. The design is like. not about Vancouver. That's what we really have to understand. This design is about making some dream picture of pedestrians, bicycles, light rail, and transit and transportation all happen commuting into Portland. Sure. That's sure. what this project is sure. about. Sure, actually any major transportation project anywhere in the state has to, of <coughs> course, handle cars, trucks, uh, pedestrian, and bikes. I mean. You're not going to get anything through anywhere in the state without those any uh, those th those basics, the multimodal and some kind of transit. And transit, of course, a common, that includes buses. Buses are a very flexible way. We could so do it with buses, and we wouldn't you, have half the problem we've got. Yeah, so multimodal means uh, buses. Uh, but it see, doesn't Portland require needs, light rail. Portland needs light rail. This is not about Vancouver. We don't qualify for light rail. That's straight mm -hmm. from the transit. 
Okay. Well, Port Portland's decided that Portland their emphasis needs it. is No, their, is light their rail. process is right now they need to put money into their Gresham Transit Center and they need to do some money reinforcing down around the Steel Bridge area where they cross the Willamette River, not the Columbia River. Mm -hmm. And uh, in order to have the funding for a absolutely bankrupt system, if they were just filing, if they'd get it over with. Is it a big rep system? Bankrupt. Oh, bankrupt. TriMet okay. should be bankrupt by any business model whatsoever. It should be bankrupt. So the only way to do that is to put a Band-Aid on it by getting more money in from another source. That source mm -hmm. would be new federal infusion of dollars for the transit project. They are not planning on using all the light rail portion mm -hmm. of the CRC mm -hmm. on the Columbia River. Mm -hmm. They are planning on using it on their existing infrastructure. Yes, and the uh, I, I just interviewed with Tiffany Couch about this, and the uh, so proponents, the actual representatives, the officials from the CRC uh, bureaucracy and from the Washington Department of Transportation, actually were not very forthcoming, uh, forthright on that. They were pressed and pressed and pressed, and finally yep. uh, they had to admit that, yeah, we're really taking $50 million out of that and put it into these other projects that have nothing to do with the CRC project, yep. with, with the, with the uh, bridge, uh, in the, with the extension of light rail into, into our area. Uh, the uh, encroaching, the com uh, you know, it, it kind of reminds me of the old Soviet Union. We, if they've always got to consume new resources and get these, this flow of, of funds in or else it just goes bankrupt. And, and you're right in that by all standards of business, the TriMet bureaucracy would be bankrupt long ago because long they're ago. losing a million dollars a week. I know. They're losing a million dollars a week. They're going that way. They're adding to debt that fast. You can't sustain that. And they got $1.8 billion in unfunded liabilities and in unpaid debt already. So they're in trouble, financial trouble. And they need us. And that, so this is they not about like, us. Yeah. This is about them. And what yeah. you've got to understand, the difference between my opponent and I, besides I'm not a big proponent of light rail in an area that does not need it, for sure. You know, well, even further than that, yeah. you strongly oppose this I, project. I absolutely do. And what you really have to understand is when I asked him, what is the compromise? Where do we win? He says, well, we need them. We need Oregon. I'm like, what for? And he says, our jobs. But doesn't that go back to the zoning and coding right here local and the legislature's ability to set policies that control the economic development in Vancouver? Isn't that his job? Why is he passing it off to Oregon? And I have an issue with that. Oregon, according to stats that I looked up last night, in the last 10 years, the same 10 years mm -hmm. that Jim Mueller has been in office, mm -hmm. Oregon has um, lost 50, uh, 50 well, where is it? They are the fourth highest um, state to have lost jobs to China. Let's just talk China, not all the rest of the world, but China. Okay, they are the fourth highest state to have lost jobs to China in, in technology and manufacturing fields. You know, we don't ship our grocery stores to China. We ship our family wage sustaining high end trained blue collar jobs. We, they have lost so many jobs that they have the 13th highest unemployment rate in the nation. We can't count on them. They don't have jobs. It's Jim's job and hopefully it will be Oregon? mine. Yes. Okay, in other words, Oregon doesn't have a very good track record. They have a lousy track record. And they're not the model for us to follow. That's, and we can't count on them to pick up the pieces of what we're not doing. So it sounds, it's our job. Yeah, so it sounds, I, I've, I've looked at Jim's approach to things. In fact, I was at a, uh, a luncheon where he was able to lay out his plan for the future for his solution for jobs. And he was very proud of the fact that he was standing behind uh, going in, actually, it's already come to pass. One, uh, I think it was $1.1 billion in new long term debt that our state has uh, signed up for in order to, quote, create jobs. And what that really has done is, is basically inflated. We, we've, we, we've become, <laughs> we're, borrowing from our, we're borrowing from our children and our grandchildren in order for these public employees to be able to have jobs. But the two categories, somehow Jim doesn't, he, he, when we, we talk about jobs, like let's gain weight. Well, you can gain weight by muscle or by fat. 
and uh, it's easy to gain fat. Just just pig out right? <laughs> and just borrow. And uh, that, that appears to be the, the difference between you and Jim Mueller, is that Jim Mueller wants to grow, grow public jobs at the expense of private jobs. And you would like to grow private jobs and, and to bring efficiency to, tr to trim it because it takes about eight private jobs as an average to fund one public job to that's, pay for that. That's absolutely true. If, uh, if you look at what he's been saying, he says that 1.1 billion, and you know I've heard it from different people. Sometimes they're saying, you know, we got 6,800 jobs. Sometimes you hear that we, we got 10,000 jobs. Uh, Sharon Wiley the other day called it 20,000 jobs. Jim Moeller called it 20,000 jobs, and he said that a thousand of them were right here in Vancouver. I asked him where. He said, well, the SR500 project where they did the uh, St. John's overpass was part of that stimulus. And he said the port. And he says, we got a thousand new jobs. So I called Jerry over at the port. And I Jerry said, Olson. Jerry, can you do me I a- I mean, Jerry, um, <laughs> I guess he escapes me. Uh, I said, can you do me a favor and explain to me exactly? I want to know, I want to understand. What are these thousand jobs? Because I'm only familiar with one company consolidating other jobs from outlying areas mm -hmm. and one which is still in the in the building zone coding whatever process and um, not quite ready yet so what jobs have we added that I'm not aware of mm -hmm. and he said well I don't know where you're getting your numbers he said we had approximately five to six hundred jobs that I guess we're termed temporary. Mm -hmm. They might be three hours, they might be three weeks, they might be three months, a few of them are still working. Sure. Mm -hmm. And 102 new jobs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and those were basically, the, the port has received a federal grant to build some new temporary, right. so, some infrastructure. It wasn't, that's all, be permanent it wasn't all out of, using, you're right. Right, for using uh, temporary jobs to be able to get that done. There, and that's pretty much, uh, that's, that's been a, a, a federal, project really that the federal funds and that's not something that has been but he's claiming that as part of his 1.1 billion dollar stimulus and that i found really interesting and he's claiming a thousand jobs a thousand jobs doesn't do much we lost fifty thousand two hundred jobs to china in the state of washington so a thousand jobs is not doing too much for me when they're mostly temporary, when we're really yeah. down to 102 permanent jobs. Yep. I talked to Jerry and he gives me some ideas. I said, Jerry, how much land do you have? What do you need? How do we develop it? Mm -hmm. Can you help me? He says, absolutely. I said, well, this won't be our last phone call then. As soon as the people elect me, I'll be back in touch with you because that is what we need to do. We don't need to go across the river. Mm -hmm. We need to do it right here at home. Sure. Let Portland be Portland, let Oregon be Oregon, and the unique uh, culture that we have here, what makes us stand out for Clark County, for Washington State, is really uh, to be tailored for us, not That's for right. them. That's right. So you like the, the, the ability for us to focus Washington on Washington policies. Absolutely. That way we, we have control here. Even with Oregon. Even with and Oregon. And certainly with China. And well, and Definitely with China. Let me, let me ask you about uh, taxes. The uh, Jim Mueller, he, he loves taxes. <laughs> you know, taxes is what makes the government run, and he loves for the government to uh, continue to grow and run. Uh, how do you uh, uh, how do you feel like we are? Where are we when it comes to taxes? We have property taxes, sales taxes, B and O taxes, and other kinds of taxes. Are we about right? I mean, the <laughs> or or should we? I mean. Are, are there things you would actually reduce taxes or keep them the same or not raise them? How, where are you? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a, 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 a comparison. Jim Muller reminds me of a lot of my female friends that love to shop in a department store. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> that's really what it reminds me of. I, uh, Texas he candy. likes to spend. <laughs> And so the consequence of that is he needs a well-stocked department store. So yeah. I, I would tell you that uh, I hate shopping, but in any case, I also am well, not fond one of spending. One of the spending. exceptions, <laughs> you're a woman that, that hates to shop. Oh, almost. I hate it. <laughs> uh, the, the truth of the matter is, is that we have B&O taxes. That means that 
coming in for those people who don't understand it reminds me of the Clinton era right to say no tax is what we used to call it where they tax the business on the gross receipts that's what that's what our B and O tax that's what our B and O tax is I think we're is. one of the, the we're either the only state or one of the few states that actually charges every business based on gross receipts that's whether right. or not you make a profit that's whether or right. not you have uh, it's just simply the amount of volume is what you're charged. That's right. Which is and the end pretty result hard for is, a startup. Oh, it's impossible. It, it makes so you, you the, change that? one of the fourth highest states in failures for new business yes. startups. Yes, we are. So, well, actually, we're, we're one, of the, one of the best states for startups, but, but we're also one of the, we're, I think we're the second from the bottom when it comes maybe to Maybe it is the second failures. from the bottom now. And so the, the it's, uh, it, the once you start a business, you have the- business climate is dropping like a rock. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's bad. So I, so I take it that you don't, you're not a fan of the current B and O tax system. No, the way and it is. it's going to require restructuring, and that'll probably require uh, some structural changes to the Constitution and the way we do taxation okay. in this state. Uh, I do so, not believe in income taxes. That was my question. And and Jim is out there right now he likes income pushing taxes. income taxes mm -hmm. on the people. He would like to have us have a head tax on every employee. A for, Vancouver City for, does already. Uh, for our TriMet uh, link up process. Which is a Portland transit agency. Right. So, uh, and again, that would go to supporting. You know, the interesting part of that is we'll lose jobs. Think about it. We will not gain jobs, not just in the loss of businesses, but we aren't putting our people to work running those trains. How does that work? Even the very basic part of the job does not create a job here. Well, I'm just mind boggled at that. What, but what, you know, I think every bus driver on, in, in our area ought to be up in arms over the idea of giving up their jobs to try it. Uh, in, in other words, we have already our own transit agency, which right, is C-Tran, right, right. and they employ drivers here. Right. And, and if we bring TriMet over here and be able to operate uh, on our side of the river, they're, they're, which is really the first, this is kind of like the, the launching pad. Right. Yeah. I've the, looked at their long-range plans. Yeah. The, the light rail goes farther and expands yeah. farther. Okay. This is an unending snake. Okay. Uh, there's an old proverb. Very old proverb. It goes something like this. New dynasty, low taxes, plenty of revenue. <laughs> old dynasty, in other words, been around for a while and mm -hmm. a while. Uh, high taxes, very low revenue. It and that's, work. in other words, you keep raising taxes thinking, oh, we're going to get all this income. In reality, we drive business away and we end up you you know, we're really do. reaping the consequence of that kind of philosophy over the last 10, you know, or, you know, recent years anyway. Uh, we are in a jobs crisis. And you absolutely the, are. So it sounds like you're pulling on the end of the rope that says, hey, let's not raise taxes. Let's not take on massive, expensive projects. Uh, you're pulling on the end of the rope that says, hey, um, fund essential, non, and don't be f raising taxes for non-essential services. Have we, I have, we have four basic things we're supposed to do. We're supposed to protect the people that means physically, financially, and in their freedoms. We're supposed to fund education, which may need some clear definition of what is education. Uh, we are supposed to provide infrastructure for people and goods to be transported. And uh, we're supposed to protect our vulnerable, which I think also needs some potential redefinition. What is vulnerable? We are not supposed to, as a government, be the local charity Charity should start at home. When charity is in the government, we lose the humanity of it. We forget to care. I don't want to be buffered from caring. It makes us better people. It makes us stronger as a group. Uh, when, uh, when I interviewed Debbie Peterson, she had this analogy of a, of a jar that you have to be able to put rocks and sand in. And the biggest components, you just rattled through a, a, a number of them, transportation, education, uh, law enforcement, uh, the basic essential services, those are the big rocks. So put those in first, and then you can put the progressively smaller rocks and gravel and finally the sand. And it, the process has been, through, through with our, you look at our legislature and their history, what they're doing, they're putting the sand in first. And they leave the last big things like, uh, can't get them change. in. So you have to raise 
make a bigger jar, you have to raise you taxes have to, to get That's there. what I was going to so say. You have to make the jar bigger to keep their project going that way. <laughs> and that doesn't do a whole lot for uh, the private industry that has to actually, all of those funds are coming from the private industry. Yeah. Uh, the government doesn't create any wealth. They have to just simply pull wealth from the economy. So it sounds like basically you are a conservative when it comes to the uh, tax side of things. And Absolutely. you are... Uh, you want to focus on essential services. Absolutely. Okay. All right. We uh, have to. We have to rein in taxes. We have to rein in labor and industries, and insurance rates, and things like that. Have you so run a business, business uh, on your own? Have you them. signed the front of a paycheck? Three businesses in my lifetime. I've actually run more than three, but I've owned three. So yes, I've signed the front of the paycheck. So you paid the. Uh, I paid the water bills and the light bills. No, they were over in Oregon. Okay. I paid. I paid the taxes. I made those deposits on the fifteenth of the month for the IRS employee taxes. Mm -hmm. I've done that. I've maneuvered through the departments of agriculture and different groups in order to take government contracts and bids. I understand the system mm -hmm. from the business aspect well enough at this point that after spending three or four years sitting here in Washington at civic meetings and, and studying and learning what we're doing in order to figure out why are we doing it. <laughs> so you're not, not simply a, uh, in, in, your experience is not just simply as an employee, you, you've been an employer uh, a number of times. Yeah. Well, we're, we've already gone 25 minutes. <laughs> so uh, why don't we do this? Uh, why don't you go ahead and, and talk directly to the voters and just bas basically wrap up what you want to be able to say to them, and then we'll close it out, okay? You got it. All right, go ahead and talk. I think as we move forward in our state, we need to keep our, our eye on the entire picture. I, I liken all these different branches and all the different things going on, there's so many, to a puzzle. Outline the frame of the puzzle with the state of Washington, and then pick up all the different pieces and create the picture the way you want it to be. You do that with your legislature, you do that with your governor, you do that with the people you elect, and they're in charge of making sure that when they're done creating policies and regulations, you have a picture-perfect Washington where you can thrive and everybody has a good lifestyle. I hope as we move forward, we can achieve that. Right now, I'm having a hard time putting the frame together on this puzzle. I really hope you'll consider voting for me, Carolyn Crane, 49th Legislative District, House Position 2, November 6th. Let's see if we can get an 80 plus percent voter turnout. And do you have a website? I do. It's uh, www.votecarolyn.com. Carolyn, so gonna, go ahead and spell it yeah, out, it, Carolyn. C A R O L Y N. Very simple. Just, I'm Carolyn. VoteCarolyn.com. What about Vote email? I do have an email. It's VoteCarolyn at Comcast.net. Okay. All right. I guess. And you can call me. What's I your, can do coffee. And the number is again? 503 984 5659 is my cell phone number. And 99% of the time, I actually answer it. <laughs> if, and uh, if otherwise, you'll, like, I assume, call them back. Yes, right. absolutely. Well, thank you, Carolyn. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yep. Okay.